Well, we're coming up to the top of the hour, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, 10 Predictions for 2016, which I think is going to be an absolute uh, fascinating webinar. Um, there's some great, uh, great content. I'm delighted to welcome back um, uh, two speakers, uh, Martin Hill Wilson and Tim Pickard. Uh, welcome to you. Let's just put the uh, camera angle on to you. So, Martin, you've been uh, polishing off the uh, off the off the crystal ball. You've had, I can tell you've had some time off at uh, the, the Christmas, and you've had a, a sort of been in a quite a reflective mood in terms of your We've polished off the wine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've had a good, I've had a great Christmas actually. It, it is, it is, um, you know, the pace at which it all happens these days, you do need time to time out. And uh, I'm not so neurotic these days that I, I have to tweet every day just to keep up, you know. So I, I, I let myself go over Christmas in terms of cutting off a bit, which is nice having and important. But I'm back in the saddle again now. Um, and I wrote, I think I wrote this just at the top of the year because we had a little present, you know, a little practice in the oh, week. Um, and it was nice, really, to have the time off and then sit back. As I said, I've been collecting these predictions for probably since November. I remember the first person. It's an interesting thing when you make the first call on predictions for next year. And there was an American guy who pulled the trigger, I think, disgustingly early. He actually, <laughs> end of war, October, he predicted 2016. But his time was impeccable. He got something like 10,000 hits. And I thought, damn. Yeah, <laughs> early bird and all that. Early bird and all that stuff. But I got 20 of them and collected them and you know, read them all through. Um, Interesting to see what's different and what's common. And, and what I've tried to do is actually not just collect the call center code. What's interesting is what does it sound like when you're looking at the customer experience people? What does it sound like when you're in the, the social or even the marketing? Mm. And it's dead interesting if you have that broader perspective how much is common theme, mm. how much is slightly divergent, and how much does it support each other? And that's one of the things I've tried to do today. Rather than us generate, what we've actually got here is a set of predictions based on other people's. Mm. And Tim Picard from New Voice Media, you've been uh, looking at a, a number of trends that have been happening across the, across the industry. So, uh, yeah, well, we so yeah, so we we and this will be very interesting for us actually to get get some feedback on this webinar because um, obviously we look for we look for what's coming and what we can build into our technology. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, Omni Channel is a is a trend that we're seeing more and more of our customers uh, work with, and want, and start to explore. Um, and um, and I think that's a that, that's you know that's very interesting. Mobile always uh, you know is uh, is on the rise. Yeah. Um, use of and use of devices across you know across devices those types of things. Um, but also just ways that um, that uh, call centers can can deal with customers in a in mm. a in a more efficient way. So looking at, at ways that um, self serve for example, mm. uh, dynamic IVRs those types of things, recognizing the inbound call and presenting mm. different menu options based on who they are, what they've done with you in the past, those types of things. Um, so really trying to up, you know, go up a gear in terms of that personalization. Yeah. Um, so it's not just personalization in terms of, um, hi Martin, you know, I know who you are, but um, actually before you get there, they're going to give you some choices that maybe you wouldn't have had mm -hmm. um, if, if, if you hadn't engaged with this in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So, so making some predictions about that from, a, from an IDR point of view. Mm -hmm. So just a reminder, if you haven't watched the uh, replay, uh, sorry, there will be a replay available later on today. Uh, that's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. And uh, also just a, a reminder that we're going to be in the chat room running alongside this. Uh, that's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. So if you're not already logged in, if you'd like to do that, uh, if you uh, there's a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the best tip or prediction. If you'd like to use hashtag question for a question, hashtag predict for a prediction, or hashtag tip for a tip, and uh, you can download the webinar slides here in the in the in the this button here. Download webinar slides when you're logged in, and then you can download log there. And uh, we're asking the question in the chat room: What has been your most successful thing you've done in the contact centre in the past 12 months? So if you'd like to just enter that into the uh, chat room currently. And uh, we've Mike uh, has said we launched a quarterly customer satisfaction survey last year. There's been great feedback and lots of pointers for where we need to uh, where we need to improve, which has been uh, interesting. Beth has said they've been concentrating on first call resolution uh, yeah. improvement, which I think is uh, uh, is a great uh, great area to um, look at. First contact resolution 
and a lot of the work we did seemed to have uh, gone right up the uh, yeah right, right up the we we did a webinar on that um, with you, John. Not, we did, uh, yeah. Back, back in the summer, I think. Yeah. Um, and um, had some, that was a very interesting, very interesting. That's a very good engagement on that one, I seem to remember. But yeah. Least a lot, a lot of people are looking at that, that and, and how to manage that. Sarah says, in the contact centre, we've been focusing on surveying customers for satisfaction and working on low scoring processes. So process improvement is certainly a very good one to do. And has seen a steady increase since the imp implementation of the satisfaction scores, uh, which I think is great. Uh, Nick has introduced a cloud-based contact centre platform. So uh, music to your ears there. Uh, well, yeah. if it's new voice media, it's music to my ears. Patsy has uh, uh, supported the increased numbers of customers through social media channels, so move towards uh, social. Uh, Robin said the most successful thing they've done is building out content for a knowledge ba uh, knowledge based database or knowledge database. So uh, oh, certainly yeah. it's one thing to have a knowledge, but building the content for that I think is quite uh, critical. Eric says we've achieved our 90% <laughs> CES uh, target uh, customer experience score. Is that? I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, increasing first part, uh, first point of contact resolution says uh, Patsy. Uh, Eva, this is a great one, I like this one. We've increased empowerment of our agents to make them fully responsible for one goal only, a satisfied customer. Mm. A major change management yeah. program has been in, uh, included to smoothen, smoothen the employee journey. So lots of, uh, yeah, lots of discussions yeah. uh, coming through there. So I'm going to pass the uh, baton across to uh, Martin Hill Wilson now. And uh, Martin, if you'd like to take us through some, yeah, of your, sure. <clears throat> some of your overall predictions. Yeah, so thanks for <clears throat> that, John T. And also everybody who's still contributing, by the way. Some really good uh, initiatives sitting in there. Um, welcome to some other people, somebody coming from Uganda. I really think this is a global audience. It's a very global audience. Very exciting. Um, so 10 predictions. Yes, do log in, because you will get the slides immediately. I think these are going to be useful for your team, uh, which you're very welcome to have access to. Uh, the first thing I want to do, though, is just to get us all warmed up if you're not in the chat room. Simple question here, um, which is, uh, are you a bit of a junkie for predictions? Do you consciously seek them out, read them, and then translate them into your objectives for the year, or are you oblivious to them all? So here's a, a bit of a fun question. How many predictions have you read, you know, looked at, engaged with, etc., etc.? anything from absolutely zip up to 10 plus? So let's just see where our audience is in terms of being informed viewers of this particular topic. So how many predictions have you uh, have you had, have you read, have you uh, looked at since you've uh, come through? So it's just quick uh, warm well, up. The answer, should, the answer should be none because they get all of the predictions from us. Indeed, indeed, the, indeed but we shall see. We shall see. We shall see. Okay, so how many prediction junkies have we uh, got out there? 36% of the audience have seen no predictions uh, so far this year, so very uh, fresh. 41% seen between one and three predictions, 12% uh, four to six, and 5% of our audience are um, prediction junkies. So uh, that's probably the, 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 the standard that you're going to have to... Uh, so, Match up against on that. So one at the so. end of this, we're going to have to find out whether or not this chimes with all the rest. Good, right? That's got us going. So let's uh, let, let's uh, soldier on because we've got lots to get actually get through here. Uh, right now, so first thing uh, is this. Uh, I guess really, omni-channel, you know, is going to be one of those big ones. And um, I, as I said, I tried to get the sources for this. So here's Shep Hyken, a uh, Follically channeled doppelganger, <laughs> uh, who is um, well known in the States and uh, came up with a stunning observation that uh, omni channel will become more omni. Yes. Um, and uh, I think actually did make a great point at the end of that little quote, which is which channels are right for you, the ones that your customers are using. Um, and although we haven't really got time for the discussion today, just because you can have 12 channels, do you need 12 channels? And I think that's a very important thing. You've got to think about this stuff strategically, and certainly as one of the pointers is where are your customers at and, and, and what are they using for, what are the journeys, what are the tasks, and all the rest of the stuff. So within that general point to be made, um, I've picked up three or four little um, subtopics, uh, if you want, just to see whether or not they resonate with you. The first one is if we talk omni-channel, we should also be talking omni-device. Um, and this is a piece of research that I first encountered November, I think it was, last year. Big conference in the UK, 700 folk. Um, and Yahoo, <clears throat> the guy who was globally um, doing some work uh, there, 
uh, uh, reporting on smartphone use um, and said amongst a number of things that what's interesting is of course that as consumers we move between different screens based on situation. Um, and what you can hear, see here actually quite interesting is we're mainly flipping between our laptop and our smartphone. Um, now what this means to us of course is to say how does that impact our journey and how does that impact the way that we are delivering service because generally speaking what we do know about smartphone tech is that it's a smaller screen, we tend to have less tolerance, we really have to work hard at reducing effort and simplification. Um, if we're also moving across devices over time, what does that also mean? So rhetorical question, but to say that's something you should be factoring into your um, user and customer research to understand that kind of behavior. So think on the channel, but also think on the device at the same time as well. That's the first one. <clears throat> Next one, and I think this is much more near term, um, and I think it's essential that we should all have nailed in this year. And that is, um, we have all moved into trying to do digital. Now, I personally don't like that language because we tend to say digital is everything that's not voice. I make the point that voice is actually completely digital because it's over simple voice, it's whatever, it's a major yeah, technology. Right. So it's a bit of a pejorative term. However, Nonetheless, we have built out uh, other channels now. What is important, though, is that our customers will want to move channel as and when requiring it. And as a general statement, we want to move from up into things like video and things into voice when we need to escalate. So think about how people are engaging with you, let's say, over an app, over SMS, over chat, over email. It doesn't really matter. But the fact of the matter is, if you're anticipating that customer requirement, to engage with you in a different way, because the circumstances demand it, make it simple, don't try yeah. to hide it. Yeah. Well, I think there's, I think there's, there's, there's two elements to this as well, isn't there? There's the kind of the inbound, the customer wants to change channel. Yeah. Should, that, that should be trackable. In other words, you need to, to, to be able to um, uh, have contextual uh, understanding of that cross-channel activity. Yeah. Um, but then there's also, I need, you know, uh, the call center end, I need to change channel now because we need to do something different, yes. or I need to engage with you in a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, and, and that takes some understanding in terms of the uh, the, the individual who's, who's managing that change, but also some technology, if you ever say, I'm going to move you from a chat channel into a video channel yes. um, to, to do something different. Yes. So, so again, if the big divide is generally between voice and text, in different forms of text, make sure that we can migrate particularly from text back into voice as and when we need to do that. So that's a simple point, but one that makes a big difference to experience and also to effort. You need to keep that context as well. You need to make sure that you keep the context between those channels. So we don't go back to... And that, and that, just, yeah. a, just a quick point, yeah, actually, sorry. The, 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 that for us is, is kind of our, dif our definition of omni-channel, which is context-aware. Yes. Multi-channels are generally more siloed and you don't get any kind of contextual crossover between those between those channels. Quite so, okay. Yeah, and actually we come back to that later on about contextual awareness and, and capability. It's, right. it's an important point. It's absolutely important. So here's another one. Uh, video. Is this going to become something that we see more of this year? Now, I suppose some of us would go, it's a little exotic, you know, it's not really out there. But let me let me put forward the argument to you. Um, some of you may know Blake Morgan. She's very well respected, actually, a commentator on Forbes. She's written a lot of on social media. Uh, she does a lot of stuff on customer experience. Um, I think her last article at the moment out there is on what is the function of a brand in the digital world. She's a she's a good thinker. Yeah. And so she did her her you know number on what's the future of, and one of her predictions was video. And she puts this argument out, which I find I find pretty compelling. You know, many of us like to talk to people we can make eye contact with. Absolutely, that makes good sense. It's not a rare day we see people walking around holding their phones a foot to their face, FaceTiming, Skyping, whatever. Customers love video and their personal lives and use it, so why wouldn't customers use it to get customer service? Good question. So where's your evidence? Well, Amazon, obviously the May Day thing, that's been out a couple of years. One I was not aware of with Annex, they've now brought video to their iPad app. Um, I know, for example, that Nationwide, you know, Nationwide Now, has pioneered their video-based service in their branch network. That's been hugely uh, successful. And she makes the point later on, both baby boomers and millennials love video sport, and we're going to see more companies tapping into the power of video in the next year. So that's one statement. Here's another statement around a video. If you move slightly more broadly into, 
are we being stimulated to go into more of a visual world? And the answer, if you look at it in social media terms, is absolutely. And the big trend that we're seeing yeah. here is live streaming. And that is becoming more and more popular. And I just thought I would show you uh, what this looks like. So working from left to right, have you woken up to the fact yet that, um, I don't know if it's completely rolled out yet, but you are now able to um, both record and also receive basically live video streams, uh, which mm. you will increasingly see uh, both from friends and family, but also from third parties. So that's going to become much more characteristic. So instead of it being primarily a text-based medium, social media, it is increasingly going to be a video-based one. And then last year we saw this huge sort of bake-off really between Meerkat, which got out the door very, very early on, um, and was huge for a period of time, and excited everyone's interests. Um, and then Periscope, which is a Twitter-owned business, said, Oi, we're not going to let you get away with that. So there's been very much a, you know, a, a competition over the 2015 to capture minds and hearts. And then if you really want to see the latest, latest, and you love this kind of stuff, go and key in Blab and go and have a look. They're still in beta. Mm. And what's interesting about these guys is it functions rather like uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, you can see there that there's four, I don't know if it multiplies beyond that point, but the app allows you to dynamically stitch together a number of video feeds. And in mm. some of the use cases they were saying, they were saying, well, it's all about a concert, you know? Two of you are out front, possibly, one of them actually recording what's going on stage, somebody you know, talking to people experiencing the, the show, and then maybe you've got a couple of people behind stage interviewing artists, you know, at a festival and stuff like that. Uh, all sorts of different ways in which you can you can bring that stuff together. So how that all pans out is very much experimental and out in the open, but the bandwidth is there, the apps are sure, yeah, there, yeah. the cross-platform problem's been sitting mm. there, the compression stuff, it works. Yeah. Um, and you've got to imagine that as we get more and more familiar with all of that, we're going to start to go, so why can't I talk to my supplier? Why don't I can't engage with a brand in that kind of way? And the answer is, no reason not to. No, no that's true. Uh, but I think there's a di there is a difference between live video, which is what you're which is what you're talking about, and yeah. something that a lot of our customers have been using for a long time, which is you know, recorded video yeah. um, for sort of self help. Yeah, FAQ so, stuff. Yes. Yeah, so that, that you know that's been around for a long time. A lot of people have made exceptionally good use of that. But yeah. this is something different in the sense that yeah. I want to, I want to talk to a to a live person yes. and resolve a live situation. Yeah. So one of the things we need to get over is 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 getting beyond the normal thing we've said is. We didn't employ our advisors to be visible, you know, mm. which is like, do they look good enough? You know, do they brush their hair? What does the background of the call center look like? We're going to have to get over all of that kind of stuff yeah. and, just, and, and just chill out. Interesting. But that's no vast different from you know what people would wear in a shop, for instance. No, not at all. In terms of uh, you know, there's no great selection policy in terms of uh, yeah. you know appearance, but there is a certain base level standard of you know be uh, cleanly presented. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, the, the bit I haven't put in here, of course, is that, and this is not true for me, my behavior doesn't reflect this, but, you know, V uh, bloggers, is it V? What are, what are they? On, on, on um, YouTube, yep. the guys that are doing all of that sort of film-based uh, stuff, they're making a huge amount of money on that. And what's interesting is, of course, is that form of connection to your audience through pre-recorded video, advising people about, you know, whatever the topic is, lifestyle or whatever like that, mm -hmm. they're earning a tremendous amount of money. So that means there's a, there's a generation very used to having a visual link to being to a source of authority or advice. So again, yeah. that's another kick out in terms yeah. of setting expectations yeah. to yeah. connect yeah. to people visually. Directionally, it's, it, I don't think anybody would argue that this is where we're headed. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, what else have we got? Aha. Uh -huh. Here we go. Uh, Facebook. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. We've been pushing very strongly Messenger. Mm -hmm. And actually, I suppose just if we are on Facebook, we will have noticed that we've been harangued by Facebook for a good couple of years now about converting and opening up into Messenger. Yeah. What they have now done is translate that into a business service, uh, which we have discussed on previous uh, webinars. And the question is, is this going to got velocity to it? And what they're doing here is they're enabling people to be able to sign in at the end of an e-commerce journey. Um, and as a result of that, signed in, you can then have a one-to-one -one relationship with that brand who can then support you in terms of ongoing service requests. Now, what is interesting about that is I tragically think it will be rather popular. Tragic in the sense that social customer service for me works very well because it's public and forces standards to rise. This takes right. us back to a one-to-one -one relationship. 
Now, we're going to talk later about the power of this tech, which is really a class of technology called instant messaging, and what that's doing to the whole marketplace. But Facebook, for that very reason, is very focused on making sure that Messenger is going to be a successful application, competing against things like WeChat in the world, etc., etc. And we're going to see more and more noise. They've got the ex-CEO of PayPal, um, who right. is pioneering this area and arguing great and big things. And interestingly, um, is pushing it very, very hard. I'm already aware of some very, very prestige marks that have signed up for it. Um, and we're beginning to see some real traction in the area. So you're going to see more and more of that as part of the omni-channel, interestingly. And here's the second point, though, it's, it turns up here. I am, in other words, instant messaging, could become the platform that replaces the browser. Now, that is a heck of a statement. If you think of the number of things that are delivered by browser, WebRTC being one, for example, many, many applications delivered by the browser, what well, they're really joining together is two things. One is, as we increasingly go mobile in our behavior, and we'll see that in, in one of the trends, is the browser necessarily the right context mm. within which we want to engage? And the answer is WeChat and some of the Far Eastern uh, IM applications are suggesting maybe not. They've already got their pay systems embedded into that mm. environment. They've already got uh, the ability for me to live my life through that medium, pay bills, engage with e-commerce vendors, the whole lot. And in that sense, the browsers disappear. It is also not insignificant that Firefox, one of the major three or four browsers, mm. yeah. has walked away from any further development of their mobile browser, yeah. saying, we don't see it working, we, we're not going to move forward. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, Microsoft has got a bit funny about the Explorer, haven't they? I don't know what they've rebranded it as. And so there's not yeah, such a concentration yeah. on, on the browser. And here's a statement. And by the way, this guy, I, it, I didn't put his name in this, but I, I've read some of his material. He is on the money. This guy has put some very compelling ideas out. And so it's saying, you know, we might well start to see instant messaging becoming the platform of choice. I don't think that is a 2016 de facto grand slam. It's mm. the beginnings of a much bigger change and hugely significant. So you need to monitor how much business is coming in by mobile and then say possibly the major medium in the future is I am. And by the way, it's a misnomer. It's not a text environment. It's actually text, video, and voice. If you think about WhatsApp, you can communicate in another which way there. So interesting thing on Omnichannel. And that's it. So now for you, think about this. In terms of all of this change and, and development, what are you expecting uh, in terms of how your customers are going to be relating to omni-channel choice and what are their expectations? Broadly, it's much of the same as it has been in, in the previous year. We are going to evolve it, but we think we can keep up to speed. Or, no, we see a tsunami coming down here. And we know we're not going to be able to keep pace given our internal change rhythm and momentum, and we think actually our customers are going to remain very much ahead of what we're able to provide. Tim, what's your guess? My, my, well, my guess is that um, there, are, there are a lot of applications, there are a lot of technologies that um, potentially could become ways in which uh, our audience wants to engage with us. Um, and in fact, a lot of those change um, intergenerationally, yeah. so the, the, the time period between moving between applications is two to three years in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, the, the 13 to 17, 17 to 24 year olds, they're on entirely different applications at this point. Yeah. Now, the question is, can we cater for that lot? Probably not. Yeah. Do we want to? Probably not. Yes. Um, so there is an element of, I need to understand my customers so that I can understand how, how they want to engage with me best. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, um, that's possibly something that's kind of behind your question here, which is, you know, do, do, are you engaged enough with your customers to understand yes. what that equation is? And the is answer, like? the, you're dead right. The answer to this depends entirely upon what size business you are, what market you're in, what the mix of your customer yeah, base right. is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the speed of that transformation is going to be different according to yeah. you. Yeah. But, it, but it's going to change. One thing is, an absolute given is that it's going to change yeah. over the next step. Probably over the next 12 months, certainly over the next yeah, 24, 36 months. So let's have a look so at the, uh, the results is. that are coming up. Okay. So let's just put these up on the screen. So we have 26% uh, expected to be uh, remain broadly the same. Okay. 
uh, 57% keep pace with our intended evolution, so yeah. uh, we'll be there in the future, yeah, sure. uh, and 17% say it's going to outstrip, uh, clearly outstrip what we're going to be able to provide. So, um, interesting result, man. Yeah, quite an interesting, uh, interesting result, so quite a, a bit more work yet to do, I think, in terms, yeah. of, uh, yeah. in terms yeah. of intended direction. It's certainly an area where there will be a lot of change. Yeah, no question about that. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, let's continue now um, and go back. So where are we? What's our next one? Ah, oh, number two. Gosh, I'm going to get on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Five minutes there. Okay, so Kate, well known, got her head screwed on very much in terms of this game. Has made uh, again. Um, she actually called this out. I think it was the Jen. Easter last year. Yeah, it was a it was a while ago. It was a while ago. You know, yeah. saying that basically we're now flipping over to increasingly self-service. This is a U US perspective, but you know, it's bound to be reflected in your own. I, I, I think it's global. Yeah. So, so very simple points here. Number one, we're going to see more self-service, and I think the important thing about that is if you're going to see more self-service, you're going to have to see more focus on knowledge management. Mm -hmm. Now, knowledge management has always been one of those difficult things to get right. If you get the knowledge management brief is a bit of a downer, because you never win. It's very hard to get it right. Um, and it's expensive and all the rest of the stuff. But if you're thinking about self-service, you can't do that without thinking about what our approach to knowledge management is at the end of the day. So that's that. Um, the thing I'd now also like to say about that is that maybe the way that we're serving up that is beginning to change. And that brings us to a topic I'm dead excited about, which is intelligent assistance. Um, and I'm pretty much tuned into that, and I love that stuff. So I'd like to call out two things. Another thing that Facebook has done, which is Facebook M, not the same as Messenger. This is um, the beginnings of them experimenting with uh, intelligent engagement, you know, with a bit of AI and all the clever stuff. Now, what Facebook have been quite honest about is to say that if I ask a question, if you can gaze into that screen, it's a, it's a question saying uh, something to do with uh, a friend has a baby, what do you think would be a good gift? And the system pushes you back some, some recommended choices. In some instances, the system is able to do that automatically. Facebook is quite open to the fact that it also implies humans to catch the ball where the system doesn't yet know what the answer is, uh, and to use humans to come up with the answer and then shut that into the system. And so we're beginning to see that approach to life. We've had all the fun of Amelia, which I mean we had on a previous session, yeah. and we're beginning to now see how AI is beginning to bring those uh, types of interfaces to the market. We also see it with Siri and all the other ones that we have on our own phone. So that's one trend there. Uh, flipping across to Twitter, this is another one interesting one that caught my eye. This is not AI-driven stuff at all. Um, this is a more uh, traditional approach, but I, I, nonetheless, I, I thought a fascinating one. India has an issue, as China does, and many cities do, to do with pollution. Uh, I think that Delhi has something like eight and a half million cars mm. uh, chucking out far too much stuff. So in order to survive that, there's a well-known approach, which is to say we're going to have on days and off days, depending yep. upon what your number plate is. You can either drive to work or you can't. And if you can't on that day, you have to use public transport, and what they're doing to facilitate people getting to work in that way is to use a Twitter-based um, self-serve. And that is that if you hashtag pollution-free Delhi and you are then prepared to describe where you are coming from and where you're going to, and you can do this by way of direct messaging if you don't want it to be visible, the system will then push you back in real time what your transportation uh, options are and, and which is the best route to work. And apparently that has been enormously uh, successful uh, as well. So again, um, we continue to reduce our customers' effort by continuing to try to understand common requirements that don't really require human intervention and delivering them through a number of interfaces. Mm. Interestingly, both of these happen to be social channels, actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, so again, some great innovation seeing there. What are you doing to do that for your customers? Rhetorical question. Uh, and to that extent, just to see the level of your ambition, I'd love to hear your answers to this point, which is, of the overall inbound customer inquiries uh, this coming year, how much of us are you targeting for being self-service? In other words, you recognize you don't really need to be pushing those back to live people, mm -hmm. um, and you know, where do you sit on that? Now, forget your ability to achieve that, but in terms of you recognizing that as an opportunity, what are you targeting? Now, so, 
again, there we go, numbers 1 through to 50 plus. If you're a betting man, Tim, where do you think our audience is? I'm going to go, I'm going to go somewhere in the middle, I think. Yeah. 11 to 25, I suspect, is uh, yes. it's well, going to be the... What's your intel? Oh, let's, have a look. Oh. let's have a look at the uh, answers here up on up on the screen. So uh, 11.25 does look like it's in the in the in the majority there. Uh, so 90% between one and five. Yeah. Uh, 30% six to ten percent. Yeah. 30% eleven to twenty-five. 17% twenty-six to forty-nine. And four percent fifty fifty plus. Oh, well, so quite a, yeah, quite a spread there, though. Um, yeah, yeah, spread, I think some people may be further along that journey than others. Yeah, they are. They may have started earlier, in which case you would expect them to, to want to achieve a yeah. you know, smaller, smaller transition. Because um, this is this has been going for a while. It has. Years. It has. Now you see, I mean, what that does actually do, which is which is of course the interesting thing, is to say what is going to eventually be the the status quo. Yeah, you know, and and by by size of business, possibly not size of business, but by vertical market, yeah. what's going to be the split? So if you're going to telco, what's a healthy balance between sell serve and live? Yeah, you know, is going forward, and what's that going to do in terms of workforce numbers, size of the, of the environment? Yeah, you know, etc. Because we're still on that journey, and I don't think anybody quite knows what the no. what the outcome is. So I think that remains a really important and very important forward planning. Yeah. Issue for contact centres and trying to stay very much alert to direct competitors to see if you can start to work out where that might land at the end. Of the I day. think there's a generational thing there as well, in the sense that I, you know, I think um, certainly my my sons are, um, you know, when I when I when we recently had our Christmas, you know, they uh, they they get their new tech, they chuck all the packaging and the manuals and everything out. We need that. Ow. Online. Know, I know, I know, I know. I, I, if there's not that online, there'll be a video of it, and somebody else. Yeah. It's like, can't give yourself up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so last generation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they don't. You know, they're, 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 and a lot of stuff. You know, you buy now, it doesn't come with manuals. It's all, it's all yeah. online, and it's, and it's all done with video, and, and we're getting the hints and in the hurry up. So keep, keep moving. Okay. Okay. Cool. So last question for us. Thanks very much for that feedback. Uh, let's keep moving on. Number three, uh, back to what Tim made earlier on. Contextual awareness. This, by the way, is just a wonderfully good example, I think. Uh, USAA, for those of us not very much aware of it, is a dedicated insurance business focused upon uh, the armed forces in, in America. And they're consistently at the top of the tree. So they're very, very good on customer experience. And this, to me, is a great example about why it matters. So. You could, at face value, simply have somebody phoning in and saying, look, I want to change my address. Mm -hmm. Face value, you do that, you finish. But if you think about the context of that, why would somebody in that situation be triggered to do that? It's maybe an act of duty, in which case. Now, there's the win-win. The customer actually receives the service, and the business was also looking after its own interests at the same right. time. There. Yeah. Um, and so, to me, that's a very, very good argument to put into place, which is to say how often are we blindsided because we're not actually trying to access the customer context and situation. We're missing opportunities both for ourselves and our customers. So again, I think we're going to see people recognizing the power of just-in-time use of that data increasingly. We had a chat offline before we started today talking about how we're going to see real-time personalization on websites. And again, that expectation drives into the contact center. So I would imagine we're going to see more instances of that, and that will literally that, okay. change the script in terms of how we engage with customers and what right. we're doing. Right. Miles away from crude um, sales through service as well, where we're trying to upsell, often in the situation where the customer's not happy. Yeah, yeah. But it's not, that, as I said earlier on, it's not just the live interaction, though. You can, you can, you can now have that change of interaction through IVRs. Oh, so I mean, right from the web. In, yeah, in terms of understanding your customer, understanding your customer needs. Yeah. Um, and then you can you can really tailor that journey through through um, through that plus also the live interaction. Yeah, well. so yeah. very different. Number four, um, growing demand for mobile customer service. Again, going back to uh, the Yahoo. By the way, go and download it. It's a great piece of research. That, but look at these numbers. So the seven billion is on the planet. The three billion of us are active internet users, of which two are social. Interesting. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. Look at that. And then. But 3.6 of those are mobile uh, users, and 
you can clearly see at the end there, 1.7 uh, of the two are mobile social. So that's a very important yep. data point, which is in, if you're talking social and customer behavior, it's almost implicitly mobile. So there are more mobile users than the actual internet uh, users, so and that's where yeah. presumably the growth and worldwide growth is going to come from. It is. So the remainder yeah. of that growth, you're dead right. You're yeah. dead right. The implications are going to be driven through mobile ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is dead interesting. So if you then look at these are global uh, breakdowns. I think if you take the full report, you can see it by region. But it's interesting <laughs> here to see who is you know the predominant users. And there's the obvious point that the younger folk tend to be more active, but ownership wise it's still weighted towards a slightly older demographic. So in terms of who you're going to try to anticipate are people likely to be engaging with you over smartphone, that's, that's interesting data. And then this last point to be made, when you start to think about things like visual IVR, of which there is an example on the right-hand side there, um, who are you most likely to target? And one of the um, outputs and insights, I should say, that they got from this research is, and this makes dead good sense for me, is that in fact the people that use it most are, are female um, it's mums basically with children who have probably got a child in one arm and a mobile in the other and they're busily organizing the childcare and the evening. You know what I mean? It's that kind of behavior. So if you are thinking about who's most likely to engage with us over a mobile device, um, go and do your research. But the global stats say probably it's going to be that kind of demographic and they will be most open mm -hmm. to engaging with you in new ways as far as mm -hmm. mobile customer service. But it's not yet there. It seems to be that given big numbers, it should be there already. But I think it's one of those things that we keep needing to track. How many of those customers are coming in over smartphone? Because as soon as you get a clear bell on that, you will want to start organizing yourself differently. Uh, another thing is just from uh, the lady that runs desktop.com. Dot com, I should say, I'm desperately happy, which is fantastic. But later, uh, she is making a good point in app support. And I would say this most apps are still being built by marketing for marketing reasons. Yeah. Guess what? We don't get a shout. It's silly. Um, in fact, the company I was talking about quite recently who are putting a challenge out to Uber uh -huh. for another app based business. And they thought that what they would be doing is primarily engaging with customers at social. I've made the suggestion that may be the case, but why don't they just embed it in the app? Yeah. Because I can't, I can't use the service unless the app's been used. So it will be one of those instances, if they're successful, their customers are going to become very, very, very comfortable with using the app. Yeah. And so therefore, to embed service, to embed FAQs and all the rest of it, that's an obvious thing to do. So we need to start thinking about how do we cater to the, uh, to either the mobile user and or the person that's got an app. Now, that's not everywhere. I think banking is a good one where you're likely to use apps lots. I think probably um, your weekly grocery is another place that you're likely to do that. You might do that on travel. I don't know. But you know the proportion of people that launch apps versus use, it's always a bit of a graveyard situation. So you do need to make sure that you've got a regular uptake. Mm. And if you do, then I think there's a good argument to embed service capability with them. Yeah. So, here's another do you know your customer question. Do you know what percentage of inbound traffic comes via smartphone? So this Test, could be, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this could this be via theory. smartphone or to some extent via mobile phone. So do you not know or can you not track it? Yeah. Is it less than 5%? Is it 6 to 20%? Is it 21 to 29%? Or is it more than 30%? So if you'd just like to... Uh, so, Jens, give us some ideas about how people might be able to do that. I haven't thought about it. So uh, let's have a, a look there, and we'll just uh, share yeah, the yeah, results a simple, a, up on the screen really here. That's a difficult thing to track. Um, yeah, there you go. So 49% uh, do not know and cannot track. Less than 3% yeah. uh, is less than 5 yeah. Uh 16% think it's between 6 and 20% smartphone traffic. 9% uh, is 21 to 29%, okay. and 22 to 30%. Okay. It, it, it is quite difficult to track, but in a way, you could look at, it's say, perhaps mobile phones. So yeah. if you've got, uh, um, with the increasing amount of um, people having mobile phones, you've probably got a, a sort of unique number, whereas when we yeah. call from the office, it was sure. often uh, blocked or you know yeah, one number for the whole number. office. Mm -hmm. So you can look through your call detail records and do a quick tally of how many numbers start with 07, which would be quite an interesting yeah. way to, yeah, yeah, to do that. I think, that. I think looking at number ranges is probably the, exactly. the, best, the best 
the best way to do it. Um, my guess is it's it's thirty plus uh, oh, because yes. um, I, our our experience across all of our data is that it's it's significantly higher than thirty percent. Yeah. So anybody that's doing that, by the way, could you get a, could you let us know if you happen to know how you're doing it as a brand? Sure. Yeah, that'd be cool. Share the love. Share the love. That'd be that'd be on the interesting. Chat. Chat. Okay, okay, well, we're going to jump across to uh, Rachel on the chat room now, and we're going to have a look at uh, what's coming up from a, a chat room perspective yep. of um, what's coming through. Rachel, what have you got for us? Hi. Uh, right, so we've had a question sent in from Glendon who says, uh, what would video add to the customer experience? We already hate talking on the phone so much so um, that when someone calls them instead of text, would video not just add time and potential issues to the process? Right, so my, yes, in addition to just evangelizing it in the way I did, my more measured response is to say, uh, rather than just using video because you can, when is there a strong use case? Yeah. Um, I would say two things. One, where you are selling a service or a product in which being able to see a person accelerates trust in the brand. Uh, but nationwide, if you don't know nationwide, they, they do mortgages in the UK, they are providing video link to experts in branch. And they decided on that route because probably buying a house is the most important thing you do. Uh, being able to see yeah, the person the biggest, biggest purchase, isn't it? Yeah, is, is a very important component. So in that particular instance, they were using it. Uh, Shu, uh, yeah, actually, no, it must, must have been a couple of years ago now, Shu, we, we talked about them, wasn't it? They, uh, dialed, they actually chirped up during one of our webinars and said, we're using it because being able to physically show the Shu uh, to the customer on screen helps again then make a, a purchasing decision. Uh, it, was also, it was also about um, difficulty um, navigating, navigating the purchase, wasn't it? And uh, uh, that on-screen help uh, allowed them to um, increase the purchase cycle by about 60%. Oh, he had an uptick yeah, up, up, up on basket value and promotion right. rate. Exactly, those two things. Uh, and then the other one, I would argue, is, again, specialist possibly medical services, whereby it's a typical conversation and it helps me to be able to see the person. So to answer the question more sensibly, um, I don't know that video, I mean, video might just replace voice because we just do video rather than voice. I mean, that might go down. At the moment, I think the specialist use cases are where it helps the task because you can see the people. And it's probably around a trust more than anything else. Yeah. Or if it helps to visually see a product and service. Those would be the two things I'd yeah. say. Yeah. OK, Rachel, any others? Thanks. Um, we've had a tip sent in by Kate Four, who said, it is great to stay ahead of the times to gain new customers, but what is more important is to do what you do now really well and not always be looking for the next big thing. Today's customers are more important than the ones you're chasing. They pay the bills you have now. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> but, but, but that's being said, also are those existing customers changing their expectation Yeah, in terms of how they're being served. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, Glendon's actually sent in another question. Do you think the increased popularity of Snapchat could be used to enhance customer service? Uh, people could use Snapchat, uh, could Snapchat their concerns and questions in? Well, the, there has been change in terms of the functionality of Snapchat, and there was a, a rumor at the beginning of last year, in fact, that uh, there was now going to be a, a persistent version of Snapchat, so you mm. could actually engage. So, as a general point, Social is probably the most prolific um, producer of new platforms for new generations. And that, that looks no, like I think that's, a, that's, that's a very fair point. Yeah. Um, and and on, that, on, on that basis, um, yeah, if you happen to have that demographic, which is a sizable proportion of your customer base, yes, you, you need to be out there experimenting. Some of them are difficult to integrate into your core infrastructure. So WhatsApp, for example, I think a lot of people have been loving the idea that they could turn that into a service channel, but it's the API on that still remains difficult. So we just have time for a couple more tips before we jump back to Martin. Yeah, we've got two predictions. Um, oh, Glendon's on a bit of a roll today. Um, <laughs> it's, it's definitely the way forward. Also provides the ability to handle multiple customer queries at once, which will have a positive impact on the call waiting. Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and uh, keep an eye on the new app Peach. It's like Twitter with the ability to draw, including GIFs, pictures, etc. 
right. Thank you for that. Very, very, um, thank you for that. That's very interesting. So, thank you very much, for that, Rachel. Let's jump back to uh, Martin if you'd like to take us through your yeah, next sure. uh, predictions. Sure, indeed. Right, let's see where we've got to. Number five. Right, uh, getting the people bit right. Uh, I saw a fantastic presentation end of last year from the grandson or the great grandson, I don't know, of John Lewis. And for those of you not in the UK, they're one of our, one of our iconic retail brands in terms of reputation for service. Mm. Lovely picture there, by the way. It almost looks like mother and daughter, doesn't it, in terms of the <laughs> rapport and the empathy. And they, they really do specialize in that. And he talked a lot about it. Interesting, one of the takeaway lines he said on that thing, which was a stunning confession, he said, do you know what? The trouble is this. Great service just isn't efficient. Well, I, said, I keep having consultants <laughs> come in and say, what are you doing spending all this time? But the thing he was doing is they do really extensive 360 degree employee reviews, really, you know, to nail it in terms yeah. of personal development. And people keep turning and saying, you're spending all the wasting all this time. So waste is the wrong word. You know, yeah. we know what we're doing and this is what it takes to do it right. But that but that I mean I think that's a really good point because it goes back to the core principles of why is John Lewis different. Yeah. What makes him different. Yeah. And if and if they can stick to that and yeah. stick to that I mean they they you know, we know they're not the cheapest. Yeah. Um, we know that they're very they're, they're they're high end, they're high quality, but you get that great that great customer service. Yes. And so they understand their why. Yeah. You know what, what? Why we do this? Yeah. Um, and it's very clear to them why they do it. And yeah. uh, um, and as long as they stick to that, I think they'll they'll, they'll, they'll remain very uh, relevant in in today's market because you know everybody's chasing this dream of of great customer service and they're using it to differentiate themselves yeah. um, as a vendor. So this is really the question that employee engagement drives customer engagement, and it's wonderful to see the first leading principle within John Lewis says the ultimate purpose of the partnership is happiness of its members. And you've got exactly the same thing going on at Zappos, you know, Tony Hershey famously wrote the book, Delivering Happiness. So yeah. let's say back to ourselves as service organizations, what is our number one focal point in terms of the people? What does that mean in our environment? Would we even dare use language like being happy? Yeah. It's a major Leadership objective. I mean, well, I think it has, but I think it has to be relevant to your to your to your business. You know, yeah. Some you know some businesses. If you said, oh, you know, our, our, we we want you to be happy, they're going to go. It just doesn't 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 you know integrate with with our with our core, if you like. Yeah. Um. So you know, I think I think um, it's it's a great it's a great thing to want to achieve, but I think it has to be part of the. The, the core principles of the company. It's got to, be, well, got to go through the whole company. I, I don't think happy as in I'm signing all the time, but I think happy in the sense of I'm really happy with the work I'm doing. I'm happy with, you know, uh, the, the, yeah. the level of being satisfied doing what I'm doing. You know, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. Because that does matter. I don't think you can get away in service environments if you're going to deliver great service experience without there's a deep level of intrinsic motivation at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. To that point, um, but it, but sorry, just well, to, just to, to, yeah. to, but it but it has to be followed up. It can't be you know we're gonna we're gonna treat we're gonna be ever so polite to you on the phone. We're gonna do all that we can to, to have that great relationship, but actually we're not gonna resolve your your problem. Oh no no no, 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 Interesting, by the way, uh, I just picked up this from Sumo, uh, just uh, again, if you're in the States, you probably know the Service Council. Um, I, I thought it was interesting where he predicted uh, a focus on this, and his number one thing was to understand the shortcomings of the current service workforce. Now, wh what I read into that is that historically, we've built contact centers based on a certain kind of priority and also based on a certain kind of talent pool. Mm. That's beginning to change. Uh, and so I think a strategic review of that is increasingly important for some folk. And wasn't that interesting that one of our listeners was talking about their hiring policy? Yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely in line. Absolutely. I see that lot. Yeah. Uh, and again, the P&Q work I'm doing in the UK, see loads of that in terms of really appraising. All right, number six. This is a bit more funky one. Are you ready for being disruptive? Not just as a business, but as a service organization. In other words, are you ready to stop thinking it's always going to be the same? And so there you go, as a starter for 10, things are not as they seem uh, in terms of who does what and all the rest of it, you know. Um, and just to continue with that, you've got people like BG, for example, a uh, big organization in the UK, British Gas, uh, probably would find it difficult, to be honest with you, in terms of innovation. They are classically 
you know, slow, large, and all the rest of it, but they've spawned a very interesting organization called Hive, which is rather like Nest, for those of you who haven't heard that brand name before, and that's the way in which they're driving it. So they're spawning agile offspring uh, to enable that. And the lady, Kim Ratcliffe, who's very much a traditional contact center person, this is the interesting debate that she put out there for us, was to say, I've done 25, 30 years in the industry in the contact center. I know the vibe. It's so fascinating when we have this new organization we built because the feel of it, the look of it, the dynamic of it was quite different. Uh, and again, I think that's something to meditate on as an industry, which is it doesn't have to always be the same. Mm. Yeah, We could be running customer service. And that's why I think we found the Airbnb thing so interesting, wasn't it, last year? It's a different organization with a different mindset, starting mm. from a different place, running customer service in a quite different kind of a way. Mm. Uh, and again, Barclays in the UK, a, a UK uh, retail bank, you know, existentially challenged, as they all are. Does it still stack up to be a bank in these days? Maybe not. FinTech is saying, no, we don't think so. We're going to trade. Mm. You know, we're going to concentrate on Forex and then work through all the other applications and have dedicated ways in which you can mm. uh, access those services. So what Digital Eagles is about, if you've never heard the story, go and Google it. It's fantastic. Uh, they are now out there all the time under the banner of teaching people digital skills, but actually what they're doing is doing a massive amount of engagement with customers, mm. testing the pulse all the time. And so applying that notion, do you really know what your customers want from you as far as service is concerned? Are you really close enough? Or is that very convenient little post-engagement feedback loop that you've got going along, which delivers you a nice little formatted NPS score? Is that close enough to really getting the pulse? And a lot of people are going, no, we need to get much deeper into that. So. Uh, on the business of voice of the customer, a number of points to be made. Number one, um, a lot of people are listening, trying to analyze, trying to act, but it's very seldom done in a coordinated way, often run by different groups. It's not a single workflow. So are you going to focus this year on accelerating the speed at which that happens? Because the research from then what knows, Bruce, in this particular case, says, do you know what? Still, a lot of us are not actually able to implement change as a result and we must focus upon moving from listening to action. I think contact centers are part of a bigger enterprise workflow. We still need to decide, are we going to resource that ourselves? Are we going to tap into enterprise-wide analytics, enterprise-wide continuous improvement teams, mm. or have little mini-V versions of these, because we need to be able to make improvements you know, at the end of the day. So I think that sort of listen, act, improve loop, listen, act, improve, is, yep. is quite a key, key thing around what we're doing. Yeah, and by the way, we're going to invest in that this year to make that real. Here's a great example from one of our telco providers in the UK, 3. They delivered a fantastic presentation uh, quite recently. And this impressed me because what they're saying here is they're not just using one source for their voice of the customer. Uh, they are using uh, surveys every month, customer responses, employee feedback, analytics. In other words, they've got a mature environment in which they can get different signals, which really works for them. And by the way, they are a great example of having done that loop that John had just mentioned and won. So what they've said is, we went out and listened. We discovered the three things that we would all as customers agree. The network is, is, is lousy in terms of being in certain places it doesn't work. The support is frustrating, and it costs too much. So they heard the customers. And they've done a ton of stuff to improve mm. each of those areas. There we go. And in fact, if you look at that logo, you see it now in the advertising. They begin to advertise in the UK as they're on the new side of all the stuff. They're raising our awareness. Hashtag make it right. And there you go. Look at that. In order that that's what they've delivered so far as a result of getting that cycle well, right. I switched it earlier last year to them, thinking it would be, you know, an interesting but possibly painful experience, being very pleased with the yes. results. Right. So they, they, they are a, 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 a yet to be recognized CX leader, I think. They've done the right. whole thing. Right. And, they're and, they're, and they're doing it properly, making it pay. Yeah. So that's a bit of a free shout out for you guys. Um, <laughs> next, oh, well, same here again. Reduce effort, predict needs. Again, was a super example from them about just posting, saying, hello, we believe you may be suffering from something because something's happened that we're aware of. Um, if so, then do the following thing. Again, are we thinking? before the customer needs to think and producing that effort for people. Number nine, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> this is a great piece of research done with eDigital Research and, and Virgin, uh, talking about the impact on NPS of two things. One, do you resolve it to did not resolve it? And secondly, 
did you do that in a way that was positive as an impact mm. on the customer experience through to negative? And they correlated that to NPS scores. Yeah. So yeah. my question to you is, what are you targeting? Out of those one, two, three, four, five, six options, in truth, tell yourself, which do you think you're most often going to achieve? And secondly, what do you think you ought to be achieving? Because if you really set that as a target this year, that really ups the stakes considerably. The interesting thing for me here is that the customer can get a resolution, but it, it but that resolution can vary in NPS score by 95 points. Yes. Based yeah. on positive, <laughs> positive to negative um, behaviours. Yeah. Yeah. That's a massive. That's a massive swing. And that, and this gives evidence to why it matters to get it right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. absolutely. It's not yeah. about hitting SLAs. It's about a completely bigger game plan here. And if you want to know why that matters, again, Bruce nails it. If you want to know, we found that compared to detractors, promoters are five times more likely to repurchase, five times as likely to forgive, seven times as likely to try a new offering, and they will shout out and recommend four times as many people. You know, I mean, that's all you know, great stuff. So finally, which links into the last point, is are you ready as a contact center, as one of the touch points, to play the bigger enterprise game, which everybody is these days, which is called customer experience, right? And so, are you ready to go? I, and here's a good example. Are you looking simply at one instance in time, the snapshot, versus saying contextually, we belong to a journey? Mm. Let's take it. One thing that we're doing right now, which is completely wrong, is probably uh, previewing uh, what the customer experience is far too early saying, did we do well in the call center? Well, we may have done well there, but actually when the person finally ended up on site and fixed it or didn't, that was the final customer experience. And to be involved in the bigger picture rather than just the smaller one is important. And by the way, have we got the right customer experience? Is it designed? Is it purposeful? Is it tied to what we're promising as a brand? There's a ton of bigger stuff. In other words, as a contact center, are we involved in the bigger CX movement that's going on in our business, and are we fit for purpose? So that's it. That's our top ten. We've just scraped by in time, uh, by the skin of our teeth. And if anyone's got any more uh, energy at your end, give us some of your tips as a result of that. So, uh, we've got time for about two more tips, uh, Rachel, if you'd like to put them in. Right. Um, we've got a few predictions. Facebook Messenger. Can't wait to see how it'll open up to work with work WFO. Or is it risks just adding another silo channel uh, from yeah, David42? Um, another David, predictions for 2016, no significant changes with businesses looking to further automate, streamline the customer journey. Um, mm -hmm. And a final one, um, if you have a happy team members, they offer a better service and care more about the job and the customers. Absolutely. That's and a nice one to end That makes in those, in those NPS scores, can't you just, yeah, yeah, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, there so there you are. Uh, happy staff equal has happy customers, and customer experience is the new marketing. I think if there were only two uh, <laughs> two takeaways that we could uh, uh, take forward as predictions, those would be uh, those would be my two. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. a reminder to everyone that uh, we've reached the top of the hour. If you just type into the chat room in one or two words, what did you like best about the uh, about the webinar today? And just a reminder, if you want to watch the replay and get copies of the slides. That will be available later on this afternoon. That's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash uh, recorded webinar I went through. So I know a lot of you would like to uh, share this with your with your teams. Um, we've got uh, uh, quite an active um, New Look webinar uh, program for the rest of the year. So if you're not booked into one of those, I uh, suggest you do that. We're back in two weeks' time at looking at building customer feedback into the into the contact mm -hmm. center, mm -hmm. uh, followed by the robots are coming, which is an uh, interesting one. <laughs> will, self, uh, will robots take over customer service? Uh, so just like to say a big thank you to our two presenters, Martin Hill Wilson as ever. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, pleasure. And to uh, Tim Picard from New Voice Media. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And a uh, big thank you to all of our audience, and we look, for, look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.